Hello everyone. Glad you're here, glad you tuned in, and glad you're worshiping God this morning in spirit and truth. I want to begin this morning's lesson by asking a question. Have you used this phrase in the last few weeks or have heard anyone use it? I cannot wait to get back to normal. This is just not normal and I can't wait to get back to it. Why do we assume that normal was about three months ago? You know, normal is a state of mind that we have subjectively assigned to something. And it's very subjective because some things that you might think are normal, I might not, and, and vice versa. Is true Christianity normal? Was Jesus normal? You know, it's interesting in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter, by inspiration, refers to us as a peculiar people. In comparison to the world, we might not be too normal. And in our mad rush to get back to normalcy, I want us to take uh, some thought about that before we run back to, to normalcy. What, what, what is a normal weekend? What is a normal day? What is a normal preacher? You don't necessarily have to answer that right now. What is a normal church? What is a, what is a normal person? Uh, quirks. Do you use the word quirks often? Do you have any? Sometimes we might say idiosyncrasies. Do we have those peculiarities about us that may not just run the line of normality? We all do. The only people that think you're normal are the people that don't know you. There's no doubt about that. You know, in our more sober and honest moments, we think, yeah, we, we've got some strange things about us. So anybody you think is normal is somebody you don't know. Wives, I know your husbands are weird. You know, we talk about this in, in, in counseling many times. Uh, each one has some strange things about them, and we all do. In fact, in preparation for this lesson, I was uh, jotting down some things, and I don't know if Chris knew what I was doing or not, but I just asked her, I said, Chris, am I weird? And you know how she answered that? She said, mm-hmm. And the inflection in her voice indicated to me that she was being emphatic. Well, mm-hmm, it wasn't just, yeah, but mm-hmm. Like, is there any other option? Well, of course you're weird. And I said, okay, thanks. You, you've helped me in my lesson. Normal is a sentiment that people feel. And our normality may not be God's. Normal is nice, as we subjectively define it. Yes, I'm ready for some normal, as I define normality. You really don't know how much you miss normality until it's been taken away from you. Well, those that can't wait to get back to normal, can I encourage you, don't complain when you get there. Because I wonder about two, three months ago, when we were praying to God for a change. You know, I got to get out of here. Things have to be different. You know, it's, it's, it's like being a child. A child can't wait till he gets old enough to drive, gets old enough to get married, gets old enough to get a job. You know, all, all of this. And then when they get there, they've wished their lives away in our mad rush for contentment or normality. I want to get back to normal. Well, what if the normal that we knew is not the normal to which God is leading us? Again, I must ask the question, why do we think that three months ago was normal? It was more comfortable than the unknown that we're experiencing today. 
but was three months ago God's will for us in our lives? Why do we assume that God's normal is in the rear view mirror? Why do we assume as Christians who serves a God that always wants us to move forward that our past is normal? Does God want us to get back to what we knew before? Maybe not. What did we know before? Were we comfortable spending our time in worldly pursuits? Maybe God doesn't want us to get back to normal. Were we reading his word enough? Were we worshiping at home before this pandemic? Maybe God doesn't want us to get back to normal. Maybe he has used this time of isolation to lead us to, and here's our catchphrase. I know we've heard this, if you've had the television on at all, new normal. New normal. Why don't we search for God's normal, which is always moving forward, isn't it? He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. I hope some things are normal again. Don't get me wrong. Kids need school. We need corporate worship. But God is always calling us to change. He's always telling us, you know, transform your mind. Be ready to take the new challenge. Go forward. In fact, that's what faith is. Faith always looks forward. It doesn't look backward. Paul says in our Philippian study in chapter 3, this one thing I do, forget those things that are behind, even if we think they're normal, and look forward to the things which are ahead. He presses toward the prize. He presses toward the goal. He presses toward heaven. Heaven is in the future, isn't it? Well, going back to normal, our doing these things, is that God's normal? What we thought was normal, was it a good normal? Was it the normal of scripture? I wonder what God's new normal is that he knew all along anyway before this pandemic for our lives when we get back to our normal. God let your will be done. Let my normal be your normal. And let me use that normality in the context of going forward. Because, you know, Lord, I don't want to be a spiritual standstill. I don't want to be a retreater and going back to what I feel is normal because I'm comfortable with it. God, allow me to have the zeal to be uncomfortable in my mind so I can realize your normal and your will in my life. Don't let me be a spiritual standstill. That's a good prayer. Faith looks forward. I want us to turn to a passage in our Bible. And yes, I am going to assume that you have your Bible and, and you're still not stirring your oatmeal or, or, or anything like that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 14. And let's begin at verse 1, and let's look at how God's people have always tried to get back to normal. And that's not always a good thing. The crossing of the Red Sea, you know it well. Let's pick up the narrative at verse 1 of chapter 14 of Exodus. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, not take away his free will, but by God's will, God's truth, he would reject it so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart 
of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside pi Hahiroth before Baal-Zephon. Now watch this in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, now imagine you being a part of the children of Israel. You see Pharaoh coming. He's getting closer and all the chariots. When Pharaoh drew near, he was the personification of their fear, of their slavery, of their death. And to them, experiencing this for multiple centuries, it was their normal. That's all they'd ever known, slavery and death. But it was normal. Not a good normal, but normal. Pharaoh drew near and the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Here it is. So they were very afraid. They were afraid of Pharaoh. They were afraid of being caught. They were afraid of the future. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What a cynical statement from God's people. You know, Egypt was known for graves. In fact, historians, ancient uh, Egyptian historians tell us that three-fourths of their land mass was graves. The great pyramids, what were they? They're the most famous tombs that, that we have today. They were graves. And so for God's people says, you took us away from the graves. You took us away from death and, and slavery. That was our normal. We want to rush back to normality. Oh, we can't wait to get back to normal, can we? Do we really know what we're asking? God provides us a new normal every day. It may not be normality as we define it subjectively. It might not be the normality of the world, but you're supposed to be a peculiar person. You're not supposed to be like the world. Transformed our thinking. Well, were there no graves in Egypt? Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Are there no graves in Egypt? That's, that's like saying, are there no fast food restaurants in Woodstock? Is there no pollen in Woodstock? I mean, it, it, was a, it was a cynical question. Well, you know, when we're afraid, we crave the familiar. We find some kind of comfort or solace in familiarity, whether it's good for us or not. They were ready to go back to slavery. Verse 12, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? No, that wasn't their word. They wanted out of Egypt. But boy, how the story and how thinking changes. Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Wow. Better to die in Egypt than to live in uncertainty. Because this uncertainty is not normal. They crave the grave. You know, sometimes we do that. We get comfortable with what we view as normality. You know, sometimes this is what addiction is. We have allowed our minds to justify addiction that we get comfortable with that and we think that's normal. That's our normality. And normality is nice. That's what an addict thinks. You know, this is nice. I'm comfortable here. It meets a need. Do we want to get back to normal? What is normal? You know, I recall a few years ago going to a place called Blockbuster. Most of us remember Blockbuster. Perhaps some that are watching this, uh, this lesson 
don't know what I mean by blockbuster. I rem uh, uh, you remember late fees? You remember going to rent a movie? Um, you know, back then, Blockbuster was very normal. Went there a lot. But you know, Blockbuster is not the new normal. And most of us have left that comfort of Blockbuster, and now we are into Netflix. No late fees. Oh, getting our movie now at the click of a button. The new normal. But we had faith. You know, when I first heard the Blockbuster was closing, I said, whoa, how does life go on? There was an uncertain time there. But now, having faith in what we experience now, it's a lot, lot better than Blockbuster, isn't it? You know, uh, in the years B.C., before Corona, you were praying, I need a change. God gave it to you. We pray anywhere with Jesus, I will safely go. Boy, I know the Israelites back here in Moses' time didn't write that song. Faith goes forward. Let's not be in too mad of a rush to get back to normal. Verse 13, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. We're going forward. We're going to have faith in the word of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, salvation to many people, even to religious people, is not normal. That's why the simple, clear plan of salvation, the word of God, is changed. It's not normal to them. To religious, to most religious people, they think salvation comes directly from heaven. Directly from God. Perhaps at the end of a prayer. To them, that's normal. And when it comes time to study the Bible, their minds want to go back to what they believe is normal. But Moses had to get the people to change their thinking. That's called repenting. And see the salvation of the Lord. In our time, it's obeying the gospel. In Moses' time, it was salvation through the Red Sea. And you know, when they saw the encroaching Egyptian armies, in order for them to be saved, in order to go to their promised land, they had to go through baptism. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 calls this experience for the Israelites. They were baptized unto Moses in the sea and in the cloud, totally immersed in order to go to their promised land. What if they said, no, I'm not going to accept that as God's plan of salvation? Then the Egyptians would have gotten them and taken them back into the land of sin, Egypt, into slavery. Stand still, Moses says, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more, not just no more, no more forever. We must go forward. We're not going back to normal. Be careful. Be careful in your bad, uh, mad rush to normalcy. The Lord will fight for you and shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Why are you praying to me now? You know my will. Tell the children of Israel. Here it is. Go forward. Don't go back to what you think is normal. That's not my normal for you anymore. You need to repent and be baptized unto Moses so you can go to heaven and you're going to have a new normal. Do my will in the new normal. Don't put your hand to the plow and look backward. Look at how God's people, and when we go through the word of God, always wanting to go back. What did, um, what did Lot's wife want to do when she was told and knew beyond any shadow of a doubt, get out of Sodom and what? But that was normal for her. She was leaving the people that she loved. She was leaving the land that she loved. It was normal. Mrs. Lot's wife, don't go back to normal. What's he telling us today? What does he tell us whether we experience a pandemic or not? You know, Egypt equals the world. The children of Israel equals God's people. 
Israel was God's people of old. The church is God's people of today. His people were a nation who had only known slavery for centuries. 430, about doubled the age of the United States. That's a lot of slavery. But that was normal for them. And that's the way they were thinking. In a way, they hated it. There was no freedom. There was the taskmasters with the whip. There was death. There was making bricks with no straw. They hated that. But they were willing to go back to it because it was familiar. It was normal. There was comfort in it. This is a people who had got used to never having enough. Not enough straw for bricks. Not enough liberty to worship God as they wanted. Not, but that was normal. Not having enough. I wonder for us. Has never having enough spiritually normal for us? Has that been normal all along? What was, think about it with me, and I will too. What were our lives before the pandemic? What was normal then that are really God's abnormalities, uh, abnormalities that need to be gone? Maybe God is using this pandemic to push us forward to a new normal. Don't look back. Don't run back. And we want to go to heaven? What direction is heaven? It's not back. When Paul is running a race, he's not running backward. I hope that we've used this time to train our minds to get ready for God's new normal. And I hope that it doesn't take a pandemic for us to do that every day of our lives. God doesn't want us to be spiritual standstills. God wants us in the fight, in the army, going forward and reaching our promised land. And I hope we've used this time of isolation to get ready to go forward and not backward. We need to look forward to our years A.D. after disease, not B.C., before Corona. Normal is just a mindset that you have told yourself and you use synonymously with comfort. It might not be God's at all. And many times that normalcy, that comfort is terrible. Like the children of Israel going back to Egypt. Slavery is not good, but for Israel, hey, that's what I'm used to. That's traditional for me. That's my routine. That's what I've done every day. Get up and make bricks. It met a perceived need because, you know, Pharaoh took care of them. I mean, he fed them. Didn't feed them anywhere near what they got fed in the wilderness. You need to read about that quail and that manna. But they wanted to go back. It met a need. That situation worked, worked in their minds, until a better way is found. It depended, though, on the wrong source. And again, that's what addiction is. Addiction meets a need. And we feel comfort there. We've convinced ourselves that's okay. We're not ready to change. But we've convinced ourselves that that's right and normal and that works until something else is better, you know, is found. Well, where he leads, I'll follow. Where is the Lord leading you? Is he leading you back to what I think is normal? Where he leads, I'll follow. Anywhere with Jesus, I will safely go. Those are, those are scriptural songs. Those are biblical songs. What are we saying? What are we singing? Just because I've never known it doesn't mean it's not normal. I don't trust humans to decide what normal is, do you? Because you know, this world is weird. Shall we give examples? I don't think I need to. This world is weird. And this world is not our home. We're just passing through. So whatever the world standards would be for normality, I hope we as God's people don't buy into that. That's why you've got to be different. It's not always comfortable being different. And it's certainly not normal according to the idea of this world. You know, the plan of salvation is not normal, as we said earlier. It wasn't a normal plan of salvation for the Israelites. 
Today's plan of salvation is not normal to most people. But faith moves forward. Faith trusts God. We're trying to reach God's normality. And Hebrews 11.6 says that we can only reach that by faith. There's always a new normal, and that's Romans 12.1 and 2. I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here it is. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Those just aren't sinful things. Those are things that might not be sinful, but we're engaged in too much. And we've got to conform our way to think, hey, God is presenting before us a new normal. And it's only going to come, or the satisfaction of that is only going to come by repenting, by changing our mind and how we think about what normal is supposed to be. Let God define it. We've learned in our Philippian study that we are not citizens of this world trying to get to heaven. We're citizens of heaven trying to get through this world. And you will not be perceived as normal. So after this lesson, I'm going to ask Chris again. Chris, am I weird? And when she says, mm-hmm, I'm going to say, thank you. Thank you. Perhaps there's somebody that needs salvation today. You know, a pandemic or any other hurdle that Satan throws in our way shouldn't impede us from obeying the gospel. Most people might think, well, obeying the gospel now is not normal. We're not here for normality, according to man's definition. If you need to obey the gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and immersion in water, do that now. Contact us now so we can take care of that as, as uh, some have already done. And as some have already done, ask for prayers to be stronger, to not be satisfied with what the world sees as normal, and not to be such in a mad rush to get back to normal when we get out of isolation. Yeah, some things we miss, but we're talking about a general principle here. Where is your citizenship? Where is your normal? What is your normality? It's our prayer today that all of our normalities will be God's. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you real soon. Good morning, everyone. Before we begin our shepherd's prayer, I'd like to read to you from Colossians second chapter, beginning with the verse six. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This particular passage has, has a special meaning during springtime when we see the trees getting their leaves again and we see the flowers and plants coming up out of the ground and blooming. We understand that the way these trees and, and, and the plants are able to do what they do in the springtime is because of the nourishment they get through their roots deep into the ground. The imagery we see in Colossians is children of God in Christ being rooted in Christ. The only way we're going to be strong and fruitful as Christians is to be deeply rooted in Christ. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you bringing glory and honor and praise to your name. We can't come thanking you for the love that you show us through the many ways we're blessed, and especially for your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we live through this time of trial, let us always remember that death has been defeated through your Son's death and resurrection. Let us always remember that you're with us and provide us the the life that we have because of the life that Jesus lived. As we live through these current times, please help us be more firmly rooted in Christ that provides us the spiritual nourishment we need to be the people you want us to be. Help us remember that you are the source of life. Help us live lives that are so firmly influenced by Jesus' life that we truly represent Christ in this world. 
It's our prayer, Lord, that the life we live each day is so firmly rooted in Christ that everyone that sees our life will not see us, but will see Christ living in us. Help us, Lord, even though we know we have the life of your Son in us, help us know that this world still tries to distract us. Our flesh still tries to pull us away. All those things that we have died to because we are alive in Christ, sometimes they don't want to stay dead in this time and in this place. We know that all those things are ultimately defeated by the Lord, and we know that ultimately you will set all things right with a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth, and the age to come. However, right now, Lord, it is often a struggle, a struggle for us to let the dead things stay dead and to continue to live in that new life. Just help us every day, Lord, to be steadfast as you're steadfast. Help us to be faithful as you're faithful. Help us to be loving as you're loving. Sometimes that's a, st that's a tall order, Lord, but we, we know we cannot do these things on our own. It's not by our effort that we can achieve some level of holiness. No, it's by your love and by your power living in us that we're able to be the people that you've called us to be. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we know that we're entering in a time that's going to be a kind of trial and error phase where we, we do not know the best decision to make. We'll not always make, know the outcome of our decisions, yet we have to figure out something. We have to make the best choices that we can. So, Lord, first we ask for your wisdom. But we also ask, Lord, for the strength and patience to recognize that we're going to make some mistakes Lord, help us recognize that all of us are trying to do the best we can with limited information. Help us be supportive of each other and all those that are seeking wisdom and help all those who are making decisions seek wisdom. Father, we pray for those whom we know and love that are different, that are suffering different ways, Lord. We, and we pray for those health professionals that are caring for them. Lord, we're mindful of all of those who in this crazy time are dealing with all the regular troubles and trials of this life. We pray for those dealing with other sicknesses and diseases and injuries. We pray for those people dealing with the loss of jobs and with the loss of loved ones. Lord, help us lean upon you and to be an encouragement and a support to one another. Help us as your people to be a blessing everywhere we can and to help us to lean upon you when we come to the limits of our ability. Help us be more and more like your son Jesus and help us to bring others further along, further along that pathway as well. Father, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As your elders begin formulating plans to begin a phased approach to returning to some normal worship and other congregational activities, we ask for your prayers and understanding. We also emphasize that our whole congregation needs each of your individual commitments, regardless of your pers personal comfort level or, or belief, to graciously follow the plan that we put in place, even though we recognize that it will be imperfect. In light of that, I'd like, to, I'd like to read from Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, admittingly taken somewhat out of context. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one of mine. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Good day and look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>